Um, <coughs> inshallah, we will follow the same format as we did last week with the uh, Salat at the end of uh, the talk. And um, I just drawn my attention that uh, the Arabic uh, notes that he had on the screen last week have been translated and they are at the end of your slides today. So if you look at your notes, the translation is at the end. Awesome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Before we proceed to uh, our slides today, there were a couple of questions sent to me by email uh, from uh, one of the brothers. Uh, one is that uh, what is about the collection of the Shia Hadith during the time of the Imams, which we discussed last week. And the question is that if all these Hadith were collected, then how the uh, Shia in particular did not appreciate the details about the 12th Imam? Uh, well, the reason is all these books were written secretly and were kept secretly. It was not something well known. Now, today we will go through some traditions which are very clear from Imam Zainul Abidin from Imam al baghr from about the 12th Imam. However, you should not think that these hadith were widespread at the time of the Imams themselves. These were confidential things which were somehow released after a few decades. Not at the time of the Imams. Not immediately when the reporters received them, they were allowed to divulge them to other people. They were very secretly kept. We have many instances of books of many of our greatest scholars who were destroyed because they were kept in a very secret place without anyone having access to them. Like for example Ibn Abi Umair, which is one of the most uh, famous Shia reporters who when he was taken to prison by the Abbasid Caliph he left all his books, which were containing tremendous number of traditions from Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Baghr He left them with his sister and his sister kept them in a, in a water container, in a cellar, uh, where no one had access to. And unfortunately the rain, came, the rain destroyed all of them. And that's why our uh, scholars say we accept the traditions of Ibn Abi Umair that he reports to us without chain of transmission because we know he had the chains, he lost them because the books were lost. And this is the issue of Marasil Ibn Abi Umair, the reports of Ibn Abi Umair which has no chain, they say we accept them without any chain because he remembered the traditions, he did not remember the chains of tradition. So it was not a widespread type of thing, anyone spotted to be a reporter of the Imam. They were captured, they were imprisoned, imprisoned, they were tortured, and even the Imams, you shouldn't think, now we will come to this shortly, you shouldn't think that for example, all Shia at the time of Imam Zainullah they knew that he was the Imam after Imam Hussein a.s. It was a secret kept by very close followers of the Imam. Then you see, for example, here after every 30 years, they release the confidential uh, documents because there's no need to keep them confidential anymore. And this was absolutely the case with Shia Imams. After several decades, they released the information. The reporters released the information because there was no danger anymore. But, of course, for example, at the time of Imam Hassan al-Askari, they could not release any information about his father or his son. But they could release information about Imam Ja'far al-Sadr, about Imam Zain al-Abidin. This is how it grew. And therefore, as I said last week, our knowledge about these issues is much more than the knowledge of even many companions of Aimah about these issues. Because these were secretly told to uh, individuals and they were kept secret and now there is a pool of uh, resources to which all these traditions have come and we have uh, a chance to look at them all in one place. Uh, 
The second question is that in the light of the above, why did it take Allama Majlis so long to compile Bihar al Anwar? Uh, well, that's a different issue. I mean, even if now we want to compile a book, Allama Majlis was a very talented man. He compiled Bihar al Anwar comparatively in a very short time. If you want to compile a book of 110 volumes now, I think it's, it would take a, a, a century to do that. So, uh, the compilation of uh, a book with uh, many different uh, aspects addressed in it is, is a different issue. If you look into Bahar al Anwar, it's not just a compilation of traditions. It is, the, the classification is very important and also it's a full book of theology, a full book of tafsir because every topic that he has uh, uh, classified and brought the traditions, he has dealt with the ayat, with the tafsir of the ayat, with the theological uh, views of different theologians and so that should have taken that long. The time frame as to when these scholars were present Okay, what is the time frame of these scholars? I said that the books that we talked about, the 6,600 books which uh, Shaykh Hurr al-Amali, a contemporary, almost a contemporary of Allah al uh, talks about is the period of A'imma Ali al-Musalam. It's from the time of Amir al muminin to the time of Imam Hassan al-Askari. These 6,600 books were compiled. And then they were of course, there were authentic, unauthentic books. 400 of them were unanimously accepted by all scholars to be reliable. And this is what we call Al-Usul al arba the 400 Usul, the 400 basic books of Shia, from which Kolaini, Sadur, and others compiled their books. So this is how these uh, uh, big compilations came about. Any any other question in this regard? Okay, we can proceed forward. Uh, now, as we said, the birth of Imam Hassan al Laskari was a secret birth, and uh, that is why there has been lots of discussions, especially later on. Uh, when uh, Western scholars tried to analyze this, and this analysis was taken by some Muslim and Shia scholars as well, through a sort of historical uh, analysis of the, uh, of the development of ideas and thoughts, they said, okay, this secret birth is something which we cannot be sure about. So maybe the Shias developed this idea of the 12th Imam and the birth of the 12th Imam later on in the history because they lost their Imam, there was no one to lead them, so they had to make something, and the idea of occultation and all these things. However, uh, well, we can accept this from a non-Muslim scholar because they want to analyze this historically while they believe that whatever the, the Shias and Muslims be, believe are, lo, are wrong. But we, sh, we cannot accept this from a sort of a Muslim, Shia Muslim scholar who is actually well versed in all these historical facts and traditions and believe in them to somehow go through the same line of analysis as the Western scholars have gone. So let's see some of the uh, facts here about this secret birth and why there was this secret, the, the birth was kept secret. Just a few uh, traditions now about the secret birth from the Imams which, who preceded the preceded Imam Hassan al-Askari alayhi salam. The traditions I bring here are from Imam Zain al -Abidin. Particularly I've chosen these traditions because there is a significance uh, in traditions from Imam Zain al -Abidin, alayhi salam. And the significance is that after the martyrdom of Hussein alayhi salam, the Shias were devastated. They thought that that's the end of everything. 
There is no other way. There is no Imam anymore. Our Imam was killed in that brutal way. Is there a hope? Is there something that we can somehow uh, think would someone who lead who would lead us uh, in our uh, struggle for realizing the truth or not? So. The traditions from Imam Zain al are very, very important. Now, after the martyrdom of Hussein, it is impossible for us to imagine what was the psychological situation of the Shia. And therefore, when Imam Zain al returned to Medina, it was somehow a lost cause, the Shia thought was a lost cause. Everyone thought that everything is finished. And Imam Zainal-Abedin was not revealing that he was the Imam after Imam Hussein al Therefore, we have in traditions that only four people believed in Imam of Imam Zainal-Abedin when he returned to Medina. Apart from his Ahlul Bayt, of course, we are not talking about his, his own Ahlul Bayt. And there were other claims on Imam as well, like the Kaysanis believing in the Imam of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya that we talked about, and then we had an uprising in Iraq by uh, uh, by uh, Tawabun, and uh, and after that by the followers, the person who uh, who claimed that he was the follower of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, uh, the the Thaqafi. And all these caused people to not, and of course the danger, people going to the house of Imam Zainul Abidin after his father was killed in Karbala as a Kharaji, as a, someone who had, uh, who had taken arms against the government, it was very dangerous. So we have, told, we have been told that four people, two very well known of course, Tabi'i uh, tabi who are from the Fuqaha, Sa'id ibn Jubair and Sa'id ibn Musayyib and uh, Yahya ibn Umm Tawil and Abu Khalid al-Kabuli. These are the four followers of Imam Zainul Abdil after the demise of his father. Then of course other people joined in. These were the main core who kept the Shi'i cause after the Imam Hussein alive in Medina. Now, the, the tradition is from Sayyid ibn Jubair, from Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. Uh, now, why Imam Zainul Abidin should talk about this more than other Imams? Because now people ask him, is there a hope? Is there someone coming to be able to rise against this oppression? Now, of course, the Imam was answering that. Al Qa'imu minna. So, he talked a lot about Qa'im. Takhfa wiladatuhu ala nas, hatta yakudu lam yulat ba'du. Our Qa'im will be born secretly to the extent that the people will say he is not yet born. So that when he advances, he would have no allegiance to anyone. Now, Keep the second part aside now. The important thing is that at the time of Imam Zain al of course we had these traditions even before, even the Prophet had alluded to it, but especially at the time of Imam Zain al there was this idea that the Qa'im will be born secretly. Now here of course, he does not mention because of the danger or anything. There is something more is more substance, substance into this secret birth. He says, so that when he advances, he would have no allegiance to anyone. Now look at this. This hidden, this hadith opens a new window towards the understanding on the co of, of the concept of occultation. I.e., well, this is very deep. He cannot be present and take side with no one. You cannot imagine that an Imam lives for hundreds of years and he's present and uh, he, he never takes side with anyone, he never says this is right, this is wrong, it's not possible. So he is, his birth is kept secret, he himself is hidden so that when he comes forth 
He hasn't taken side with anyone. He has no allegiance. Uh, he has paid no allegiance to anyone, no pledge on him. So on the other hand, he cannot start his duty until the time is right. When time comes, of course, then he mentions what is right, what is wrong. Of course, he is the side. He doesn't take side with anyone. He is the side. Now, a similar hadith is reported from Muhammad Sadiq alayhi salam and other ayam alayhi salam. Sahibu had al-amr ta'ma wiladatuhu ala al the, both these traditions are from Kamaluddin of Saduq. Sahib Hadha al-Amr ta'ma wiladatu ala hadha al-khalq la'alla yakuna la'ahadin fi unuqihi bay'atun idha kharaj. The same thing. The incumbent of this affair, that is the affair of taking, uh, rising against oppression, assuming the leadership, his wilada would be uh, confused, people cannot know about it, and the reason is because he doesn't want to have bay'a with anyone. He should be away from all these events which go during the history in future, of course, future, future history. Now, the other tradition is very interesting. This is from Abu Hamza al-Somali, um, of course you know Dua Abu Hamza, which uh, you recite in, in Shah Ramadan is from this man. An Abi Khalid al Kabuli. Now, this is Abu Khalid al Kabuli is one of those four which I mentioned. Now, interestingly, Abu Khalid al Kabuli was a supporter of Mukhtar al Thaqafi and a Kaysani when he came to Medina. He came to see who is the Imam. He was Kabuli from Kabul, so he was from Afghanistan. He traveled from Afghanistan to Hejaz. And of course later on he established, uh, settled there, and we are told that Imam Zanul Abedin helped him, assisted him to travel to Kabul to visit his family once, because it was of course very expensive, much more expensive than a air ticket, of course, to travel from Medina to Afghanistan at those times. So he was assisted by Imam Zainul Abedin once to go, to go back to Kabul to visit his family. Now, he came as a Kaysani. He didn't know that uh, Imam Hussein salam, had actually willed to one of his sons, because he was a very pure a man of very pure soul. Yahya ibn Mutawil, the other person, started to talk to him and told him, come and visit Ali ibn Hussein. As I said, it was dangerous at those times to visit Ali ibn Hussein. Salam. And uh, he had a name when he was born. Uh, during his childhood, his mother used to call him Kankar. Kankar should be an Afghan name. I don't know, it's Pashtu or whatever. I don't know what, 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 what sort of name is that. So, and no one knew about it. It was just uh, during his childhood, his mother used to call him Kankar. Pro probably a, a very nice name for children. And as soon as he entered to Imam Zain Rabbani's house, Imam told him, how are you Kankar? And he was amazed. So, how this man knows my name, Kankar? And then he started to learn more about Imam Zainul Abedin. And of course, this was due to the fact that Imam knew probably that this is a pure soul man. And uh, he would uh, uh, follow the, the, the hack if he finds about it. So he became one of the most, the closest disciples of Imam. And then he asked about these issues of Imama, secrets of Imama, and Imam, of course, did not uh, keep any information from this Abu Khalid. Now, Abu Khalid al-Khabuli says, دَخَلْتُ عَلَى سَيِّدِي عَلِي يَبْنِ الْحُسَيْنِ زَيْنِ الْعَابِدِينَ عَلَيْهُ السَّلَامِ I visited Imam Zain al-Abidin, alayhi salam. I told him, يَبْنَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أخبرني بالذين فرض الله تعاتهم ومودتهم 
واوجب على عباده الاقتداء بهم بعد رسول الله so i don't know when this question was posed to imam zain al abidin by abu khalid it is when probably he still didn't know who was the imam after hussein alayhi salam and probably still had these doubts of uh, of the past that uh, it was probably Muhammad ibn Hanafiya because it was somehow reasonable to think coming from Imam Hassan to Imam Hussein then to their brother again to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya rather than going to the son and uh, still he was not convinced uh, very easily and uh, we have another report that at, on one occasion Imam took him to Hajar al-Aswad and Hajar al-Aswad started to witness I don't know whether this situation is right or not but it's not something improbable. There are probabilities here about that. So he says that, uh, O son of the messenger of God, inform me of those whose love and obedience is made a duty by Allah. He said, O Kabuli, uh, it's interesting, Imam calling him by his city, Kabuli, uh, because Naturally, he should call him Abu Khaled or, or Kankar, so to speak. But here, yeah, he, he, he calls him by Sidi Kabuli. The Ulul Amr, those who Allah has made Imams for the people and has made their obedience compulsory, are Amirul Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then my uncle Al Hassan. Then my father Al Hussein. Then the Amr has ended up in us. That, is, that means I am the Imam after him just removing all confusions about Muhammad ibn Hanafi, and then he stopped. I told him, my master, we are reported from Amirul Mu'mineen that the earth will never be void of a hujja. This is of course a well-known hadith from Amirul Mu'mineen, that the earth will not be without a hujja. Allahumma bala, this is Nahjul Balagha as well, inna al-arda la takhlu min من غائم لله بحجة إما ظاهرا مشهورا وإما خائفا مخمورا He says that we are reported from Amir al-Mumini that the earth will never be void of a hujja from God over his servants. So who's the hujja and the imam after you? Good question, of course. قال ابن محمد He said my son Muhammad, that's Imam Baqir, whose name in the past book is Baqir. Now it's in interesting. What, which past books? We, we, we do not see in any past book such a name as Baqir or anything. However, as we have in many traditions, all the books of the past prophets revealed to them including the Torah, Injil, they are with the Imam. They should be. The Imam should be aware of the past revelations. Not the, the, the version of Bible which is in our hands, certainly, but the true version of Bible revealed to Musa salam, should be with the Imam. The revealed version of Injil should be with the Imam. And all books of the past. And that's why you see Imam Raza alayhi salam when he uh, he comes to these huge sessions of debates and discussions which was uh, arranged by Ma'mun he brings lots of quotations from Injil, from Torah, from Zabur and he brings those quotations which of course were accepted and were still there in their books. So that, of course, the dialogue would make sense. Where did they have the knowledge? Of course, the knowledge of the past books is given to the Prophet and Imams salam. However, the very written books of the past as well are with the Imams. So, here the Imam says, Ismuhu fi suhuf al Baqir whose name in the past book is Baqar, for he penetrates the kernel of knowledge. Yabqarul ilma Baqra. Baqar means to pierce, to penetrate. So he penetrates to the very core of knowledge. Huwa al-hujja wal-imam ba'di. 
He is the Hujan Imam after me. وَمِن بَعْدِ محمد ابنه جعفر. After Muhammad is his son Ja'far. وَاسْمُهُ in the أَحْلِ السَّمَاءَ الصَّادِقِ And his name with the people of the heavens, with the inhabitants of the heavens, not people, there are no people in the heavens, it's angels of course. The inhabitants of the heavens is Sadiq. It means that this is something by which he is known to the angels. I told him, uh, uh, I said, why is he named the truthful Sadiq? my master, why all of you are truthful? Couldn't we say that Imam al-Hadi is a sadiq? Yes, of course he is sadiq. Or Amir al mumin is a sadiq. So why is he named a sadiq while others are not? He said, my father reported from his father, from the prophets, alayhi salam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when my son Ja'far Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib that he gives him the full uh, uh, name until Amir al-Mu'mineen uh, when he is born name him as Sadiq so the Prophet told Amir al-Mu'mineen to tell Husayn alayhi salam to tell Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam to tell al-Baqir alayhi salam that when this son is born name him as Sadiq. Why? Because his fifth descendant whose name is also Ja'far would claim Imama lying and daring against God. So he will be Ja'far al-Kadhab. So to differentiate between these two Ja'far, we have Ja'far al-Sadiq and Ja'far al-Kadhab. Who fabricates lie against God and claims what he does not deserve. He will be against his father and jealous to his brother who will intend to reveal the secret of God on the occultation of the friend of God, Waliullah. And the ghaybat Waliullah, this is a secret. His birth is a secret, his occultation is a secret. And this man, vying for the worldly position of Imam, he thought that this is something that is just like politics, for example, he, he goes for it. This man wants to reveal the secret of the Imam. And that's why he's called Ja'far al-Kadhab, because he claims the Imam for himself. It's very interesting. He, he went to, uh, uh, to the Wazir, Ja'far al-Kadhab, and he said that I pay you 200 dirham every year, and you recognize me as the Imam of the Shia. He said, it's very funny what you say. We are looking everywhere for these followers. We are ready to pay them with lots of money so that they just tell us who is their imam. And you are telling me, I appoint you as their imam. Such a funny, silly man you are that you, you, you are saying this. But anyhow, I mean, shaitan always uh, is uh, at the door. ثُمَّ بَكَى عَلَيُّ بْنُ الْحُسَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ بُكَاءً شَدِيدًا Then he cried hard and said, Imam Zain al-Abidin, It is as if I am looking at Ja'far al-Kadhab while he is leading the oppressor of his time to search the affairs of Waliullah who is hidden under the care of God and tries to put someone in charge of his father's house out of ignorance for his position. Of course, this story is very long, the way Ja'far treated the family of his brother after his demise, and the way he brought soldiers in, looking everywhere, searching everywhere, and he said, a child is born, we have to look for it, and of course, the child could not be found. We'll talk about it later on. And a strong desire to kill him would, uh, would he find him and out of greed to grab the bequest of his brother unrightfully. Of course, he cries both for the Imam who is hidden and for this Ja'far who is one of his descendants doing all these things uh, out of the drive from Shaitan. Uh, فَقَالَ أَبُوْ خَالِدْ 
Abu Khalid says, فقلت يا ابن رسول الله وإن ذلك لكائن I said, O oh son of the Prophet, is this really going to happen? Is such a thing real? He said, yes, by my Lord. This is written in the Sahifa, in which is the mention of the misfortunes that will inflict us after the Prophet. This is Sahifa Fatima, of course, which was given to, to him. Probably, is Sahifa Fatima, in which everything, that, that's what the Imams always claim, that وَإِنْدَنَا Sahifatu Fatima, in which there are all events which are going to happen in future. Of course, you might, uh, you might say that this book should be really huge, because, of course, everything going to happen in the course of history for the uh, descendants of the Prophet, this, this needs volumes and volumes. However, it might have been something written in a sort of secretive way that only Imams could find out what the meaning of that is. فَقَالَ أَبُوْ خَالِدْ فَقُلْتُ يَبْنَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ يَكُونُ مَاذَا I said, O son of the Prophet, what will happen after that? He said, then this, the disappearance of the Waliullah, the twelfth of the Awsiya of the Prophet and the Imams after him will continue. The disappearance will continue until God knows when. Now, why did I mention this long hadith here? It's very interesting because all the details of the story <coughs> of the birth of the Imam, the secret birth of the Imam, the way things would unfold, what Ja'far al kazab his uncle, would do to find him and to kill him so that he gains the position of Imama. All these details are, are mentioned in this hadith. Now, there are two possibilities here. Uh, for those who say that these ideas developed as the history of the Shia went for, forth. Uh, one possibility is that the hadith is correct, as is in Kamaluddin and Saduq bring it with a reliable chain. And the other is that to say all these traditions also were made up afterwards, as people like Shacht and Goldziher say that all the traditions uh, in Islam from the Prophet are made up later on to support some views and ideas. We have to choose between these two. One is to say that these traditions are there. It's not only one tradition. There are tens of traditions coming from the Prophet, from different Emma. And then we have to say that these reporters who reported these things, which were very respectful, honorable, reliable people, meticulously tried to fabricate all these to support a view. After, of course, that uh, idea of the Imam of the 12th Imam was developed, we have to believe in it. It's again, it's not something academic. You have to believe it. You ha just have to say that I do not believe in the uh, idea of 12th Imam, so I have to find some analysis for it. As, for example, Shacht or Goldziher have said, we do not believe in all this rubbish that the Muslims say, so we have to find a, an explanation for it. And this is our explanation. These were made up later on by the jurists, by the reporters. Okay, they are right, because they are Muslims. If they, if they believe that Prophet was a Prophet and received revelation, they would have become Muslim. We, we give the, it's just like, for example, if we want to analyze a faith which you don't, do not believe in, yeah, of course, we, we look for some explanations. However, it's very amazing that some Muslim scholars have taken the same explanation and the same analysis and have mentioned them in their books, and this is very amazing. That means we have to reject all these traditions, and we have to say that these reporters like Sadur, like Mufid, like Tusi, like people before them, they meticulously made up all these traditions, which is very difficult, very unacademic to think in this way. It's very difficult to prove it. As I said, it's a matter of belief that you have to believe in it. It's not an academic type of uh, analysis. And uh, uh, 
Uh, another tradition from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam to the same effect. As I said, there are hundreds of traditions in this sort, sort of predictions, not predictions, foretelling about what will happen in future, about the 12th Imam. Initially, at the beginning of these lectures, if you remember, we talked about the 12 Amirs or the 12 Khalifas about which the Prophet talked. And they are in Bukhari, in Muslim, in all Sunni books that there will be 12 Khalifa after me. Now, this knowledge that, okay, who's the 12th one? What will happen to, 12th, to the 12th one? Were quiet, understood, and uh, understood by companions of the Prophet, and they had traditions compiled in that effect. Uh, the difference uh, between the Shia and Sunni Hadith, I don't say this because I am a Shia, but uh, you can explore for yourself. The difference between the Shia and Sunni Hadith is that the Shia, the Sunni Hadith talks about issues very succinctly, without deeper explanation. Because, of course, there were just quick references from the Prophet about them. And sometimes people even didn't ask the Prophet about these uh, concepts. One example is the concept of Arsh, for example, or Kursi, which we have in the Quran. You just compare the traditions which have come from the Imams about what Arsh is, and the traditions in the Sunni books. Traditions in the Sunday books are just, we accept it, do not ask about it, it is just a throne, we don't know what is the quality, the explanation of it, and not more than this. And if they want to go into details in unreliable traditions, then of course the details will become somehow funny. Now, you go to the traditions of Aimba alayhi salam, you see there's deep knowledge. Deep knowledge there. These were the people who knew about these things. Certainly, uh, Imam Malik was right to say, do not ask me how Allah is sitting on the throne. You know the, the story that someone asked him that, Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa, kaifa, kaifa istawa, how Allah is sitting on the throne? He said, we know that he's sitting on the throne, we don't know how, don't ask. It's better to ask. He's right, because he doesn't have knowledge about it. What should he say? He should say, I don't know. Don't ask about it. But if you go to Imam Jafar al-Sadr, he explains to you, what is it? What's the meaning of him sitting on the throne? What is the meaning of the throne? How the throne is created. What is the relation of the throne with other parts of creation. Now, this, in that respect you take it. Now, you come to traditions about these twelve. Of course, these were the people who were members of these twelve, certainly. And they knew who these twelve are. What's going to happen to them. Who's the last one. What is the situation and destiny of the last of these twelve? So you find the same difference in Sunni Hadith and in Shia Hadith. So here we should, we would expect in Shia Hadith, in from Aima Ali Musala, a really detailed explanation of these things, and especially when it comes to the destiny of the twelfth Imam, we have to get full information about it, and certainly. Uh, as we proceed, you will see that the abundance of information about the time just before his reappearance, when, what happens when he appears, what happens afterwards, all these information were there with the imams, certainly. And they had them in different books, it, with different, uh, of course, inspirations that Allah had given them. Of course, their knowledge... Maybe we have to have a, a, a full course about the different categories.
categories of the knowledge of the Imam, where, what was the source of their knowledge. They had not only one source of knowledge, many, many different sources of knowledge they had. Now here, both Kulayni and Nu'mani, Nu'mani in his book al ghaybah and Kulayni of course in Al-Kafi, they report from Imam Jaf, uh, Abi Ja'far uh, alayhi salam, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, uh, Abdullah ibn Atta, Abdullah ibn Atta, I have written here Abdullah ibn Rabah, sorry, this, this is a different man, Abdullah ibn Atta, the Arabic is right, says, I told to Imam al-Baqir, you have huge following in Iraq, and by God, there is no one like you in your family, why then you do not rise? He told me, فَقَالَ يَا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بْنَ عَطَى قَدْ أَخَذَتَ تَفْرَشُ أُذُنَيْكَ لِلنَّوْكِ He said, you pay attention to the dim-witted, the Shia with little knowledge. And of course, A'imma alayhi wa always complained about this Shia with little knowledge. سَفَلَةُ أَحْلِ kufa The uh, sort of cultural riffraff of Kufa, who accepted anything about the Imam, who attributed anything they heard to the Imam without uh, investigation, and they came up with very funny beliefs about Imam and all these things. And inshallah, we are not from those people. We have to be very careful. What we believe about the Imam should be correct belief, not something like what Imam usually at that time talks about Anoki, stupid people who talk about our Imam the way they believe that we are the Imams. Uh, you pay attention to the dimwitted. By God, I'm not your man. Wallahi ma ana bisahibikum. That means that person who you think would rise with sword is not me. Qala qultu lahu, and Ayyim alayhi wa sallam actually conveyed this to all their Ahlul Bayt, like Zayd ibn Ali, like Yahya ibn Zayd, like Banu Hassan, that you should not come out with, in the name of Mahdi. We discussed this before, of course. Qala qultu lahu, faman sahibuna? I told him, uh, who's our man then? Who's the man who would lead us? قَالَ أُنظُرُوا مَنْ أَمِيَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَلَادَتُهُ فَذَاكَ سَاحِبُكُمْ He said, look for someone whose birth is veiled from the people. He is your man. Now, this is a very clear indication. This is about 100 years before the birth of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, saying that his birth will be in confusion because of the secretive uh, way that one... The, the, the situation is as such. I mean, Imam Hassan al asari why Imam Hassan al asari was put in a garrison, in a military barrack, to live there? Because they wanted to know what's happening, what's going to happen. Who's the 12th? Is this the 11th? Who's the 12th? They wanted to know about it. Because everyone now had this idea of the 12th. Who's the 12th? You know, Imam Hassan al Askari was living in that garrison since he was four years old. And he, he could not come out of it, except when he wanted to report to the court. He had to report to the court twice a week. And he was under, under strong, strict surveillance. His wife was under strict surveillance, his house, he himself, to know what's happening, is a child is going to be born or not. So, here, a hundred years before that, it is said that uh, look for someone whose birth is veiled from the people. He is your man. None of us would be pointed at by fingers or talked about by tongues unless they die of sorrow or are killed. Now, this is very interesting. You go around and say that Imam is Ja'far ibn Muhammad or Muhammad ibn Ali. You say and spread, you go and spread this 
and we are killed. And this was the case with all the Imams, of course. They never said we are Imams to common public, certainly. That's why you see many Sunni scholars went to Imams' lessons, lectures, without knowing that they are Imams. They just wanted to, uh, to benefit from their knowledge. And Imam never revealed, for example, in those big lectures on Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, many of the students didn't know that he is the Imam of the Shia. Only those very close disciples. As I said, our knowledge about Imam Ali is now much more than the knowledge of the contemporaries of Ayyam Ali Musala. And here Imam says, okay, you go and spread this. You have heard the story of Ali ibn Yaqtin, for example, in the court of Harun al-Rashid. That he denied that he is a Shia, and denying that Musa al-Qadim is an Imam. Of course, he was in prison most of his life on the doubt that the Shias believed that he was an Imam. Now suppose that there was a definite knowledge that he was the Imam. What would have happened? Well, of course, eventually he was, he was martyred. But the point is that this secrecy was something we have not lived in that situation to know what was the, uh, the atmosphere, what type the atmosphere was. Here Imam says, you go around, you point at us, he's the Imam, you, you, for example with your friend you go, you know this is the Shia Imam, and then that friend is a spy and goes and report and then people come, then pressure would come on us, and so much pressure that we die of sorrow, or we are killed. This is not going to happen for the twelfth Imam, certainly. Because if he is like us, like one of us, he would die like one of us. So, why Imam brings this here as a, a sort of uh, reason for why he has a secret birth? It's because you spread the news in a way that uh, we get in trouble. Now, This is from Ahmad ibn Ishaq al-Ash'ari al-Qummi, who was uh, one of the, reportedly he met, of course he lived in Qum, he, he met Imam al-Askari a couple of times. It was very difficult to meet Imam al-Askari because as I said he was living in a military barrack, people who went there, the, the companions of the Imam, they, they should have found really, really uh, very difficult ways to, to get access to his house, for example. Here Ahmad ibn Ishaq says, دَخَلْتُ عَلَىٰ أَبِي مُحَمَّدْ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فَقَالَ لِي يَا أَحْمَدْ what was your stance towards what the people were in doubt about it? Uh, well, of course, again, the news was given to some companions, not to others. Uh, a faraway city like Qom, it doesn't matter if the news spreads. And the news had reached to the scholars in Qom that an, the Imam is born. But of course, no one knows about their whereabouts. So, Imam is asking, when you heard the news that my son is born, what was your stance? I said, my master, when the letter containing the news of our master's birth arrived, no man or woman or discerning child remained unless all believed the truth. Now, of course, this should have been a very strict circle. And this tells us a very interesting fact, that despite the strict secrecy, still the Imam had the means to spread the news to some scholars, that the Imam is born. And this answers the very, very difficult question, that if this was so secret, how come no considerable scholar, she is scholar, 
There were of course pretenders, there were people who were not scholars and they somehow claimed things for themselves, especially they claimed to be naib of Imam, not of course claiming that Imam was not born. How come that all the scholars were convinced that the Imam was born and he was the Imam and everyone were convinced about his Nawab as well? Now when we come to his Nawab, if we get time, probably that, that's a side issue. It's very interesting that what a sort of network, underground network was there, that this news of, for example, who's the next night? Of course, this was again a secret news. Who's the next night? All the scholars agreed upon it. In Qom, in Khurasan, in Arab, in Hejaz, there was no disagreement at all. It's very, very amazing. I think this needs investigation. This needs a real research that what sort of networking was there that the secret news were accepted scholars like scholars in caliber of the father of Saduk, for example, they were the contemporaries in the minor occultation. All the scholars in his caliber, they had no disagreement on this issue and this is very strange how this news was spread. Now, here is one hint that a letter went to Qom. Ahmad ibn Ishaq was a very reliable person. He had the news. He spread the news to some and he says everyone became happy. Uh, he said, did you not know that the earth would not be void of hujjah? Which, of course, of course, the, the, the hadith is a bit broken. It's, it, this part of the uh, conversation is just, just stops here. The interesting is here what Ahmad ibn Ishaq says. Then Abu Muhammad, that's Imam Hassan al Askari, instructed his mother to Hajj pilgrimage, to go to Hajj, in the year 259. Of course, this is this then doesn't mean that Ahmad ibn Ishaq was there is reporting the history, what happened, and informed him of, sorry, informed informed her, informed he, his mother of what will happen to him in the year 260. So when he instructed his mother to go to Hajj, he told him that next year I'm going to die. He called as sahib alayhi salam to his presence and made his will and submitted to him the great name and the bequest and the weapon. Then the mother of Abu Muhammad left for Mecca with the sahib. Now this is a very interesting hadith. Very, very interesting hadith. First of all, Imam Mahdi alayhi salam was not all the time in Samarra. In 259 we know that he left for Mecca. He was not there anymore. We have traditions that he was present when Imam al-Askari was on his deathbed. So probably he had come for to be present for the demise of his father. And again he went. I mean, he did not stay in Samarra. Samarra was not a safe place. It was a, it was an army barrack where they used to live. And uh, that moment of death of Imam Al Askari, when he came, there was not time for making the will or something like that. So, one year before that, according to this hadith, all the secrets of Imam was transferred to Imam al-Mahdi when he was four years old. Now, three things are mentioned here uh, as uh, transferred to the Imam. Al-Ism al uh, This is bigger than what we can talk about, of course, Ism al -Azam. It's not a name, certainly. It's a knowledge which he conveyed or transferred to the heart of, the, of Imam Mahdi so he gave him a sunnah. Wal mawarif. Mawarif, what are the mawarif? The books which are with the Imam. 
Jeffre and Jamia and Sahifa and all these things and some belongings of the Prophet peace be on him especially one thing which is the sign of the Imama the weapon, the sword of the Prophet which goes from one Imam to the other which usually the sword of every person used to go to the to the heir or wasi, someone who had who was in charge of the affairs of the of the deceased, like the, the greatest son or something. And this weapon of the Prophet came down to Amir al Mu'minin and it should be now with the uh, with Imam al Mahdi al Salam. It's just like the tabut, the chest in Banu Israel, where, which contained the, uh, the Torah. And we have in the Quran about uh, Talut, in Ayata Mulkihi, and Yatia Kumut Tabut, Fihe Sakina to Merabukum. The sign of his kingdom over you, that he is appointed by God, the sign is that the Tabut, the chest, will come to you in which there is sakina and calmness from the Lord. The sign of Imam Mahdi is that the sword of the Prophet is with him. And with, with that sword is victory, of course. So, he transferred all these to the Imam and Abu Muhammad left for Mecca with the Sahib a mother of Abu Muhammad, uh, Nargis or uh, Sorry, mother of Abu Muhammad, not, not mother of Abu Mahdi alayhi salam. Uh, moved to Mecca with Imam alayhi salam. In, in fact, in those five years of the life of Imam al Askari, the whereabouts of the Imam was unknown. There are hints that at times he used to come to Samarra, but not all the time he was there. Now, even if we say he was there all the time, definitely one year before the demise of Imam al-Askari, he moved from Samarra to Mecca. Other reports however, imply that he was with his father at the moment of his death, as I mentioned, but that means it was a very quick sort of visit, just at the moment of the death of the Imam alayhi salam. Mawarith, yeah. That the books like Sahifa, Jafar, Jamia, and uh, some other belongings of the Prophet of Amir al Mu'minin and these things. Now, after that, what happened? Where did the Imam live? Most of the traditions. Uh, imply that Imam lives in Medina or nearby. And this Radwa, again the mountain which is close to Medina, which we discussed about, might be one, one place. In al kafi we have a reliable report uh, from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, لا بد لصاحب هذا الآم هذا الآم من غيبة ولا بد له في غيبته من أزلة it's a very interesting hadith. Of course, very difficult to, to explain. Now, Kulaydi in al kafi and Tusi in al ghayba from Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq salam, the incumbent of this affair, this is what I have translated as sahibu had al-amra. This affair, of course, is the affair of the Imam, the Imam who rises, who is Qa'im, and of course, Sahib Adalam, the one who is incumbent with this sort of duty. The incumbent of this affair would necessarily have disappearance, ghaybah, and there would be necessarily loneliness in his disappearance. Of course, none of us would really wish to be in place of Imam al-Mahdi, living alone. It's very difficult. Living alone is very difficult. Maybe good for a couple of years, <laughs> but not for 1400, 1200 years, and God knows how long is that going. But of course, he's not completely alone, but a few people around him maybe. However, he loses them all the time, isn't it? They don't have the long time, the long life as he has. It's very difficult. 
I mean, you just live to see other people, your uh, dear ones die and die and die one after, uh, after another, and especially you don't have that sort of huge connection uh, with people. So, here Imam says, لا بد في غيبته من أزله. He should have loneliness, of course. Medina is a good place of residence. So, he is implying that he who lives in Medina, because it's beside the tomb of the Prophet. Maybe Imam Ali Salam visits the Prophet's shrine every night. Who knows? And uh, there is no fear among 30 people. Now, these 30 people, of course, is very puzzling. Of course, he is lonely, but with 30 people, we don't regard it as loneliness. Are the 30 people around Imam al-Mahdi Does he have 30 companions around him all the time? Of course, as I said, these are not going to have the same lifespan as Imam al-Mahdi has, so they have to replace one another. And therefore, there is this possibility that those who really, really get close to uh, get close to in, in their spiritual life, close to the type of a status of Imam salam, they are chosen to serve Imam. However, they are chosen to serve. They are not allowed to say anything about this, even if they are in in contact. So anyone. Anyone claiming that, just tell them you are a liar. Because that, anyone coming to that status certainly would never reveal anything about it. Uh, there is another hadith which explains this a little bit. Uh, this is again in Al-Kafi. Now the 30 people referred to here may be those alluded to in the following hadith from Omar Sadaq. Now, I've chosen the traditions mainly from Al-Kafi and Ghibah because these are reliable sources. There are other traditions, of course, which we cannot rely upon. Lil-Qa'im Ghaybatan. For the Qa'im, there are two Ghaybas. There are two occultations. Ihdahuma Qasira wa al-Ukhra Tawila. There will be two occultations for the Qa'im. One, of, one will be short and the other will be long. In the first occultation, no one knows his whereabouts except the elite of his Shia. Okay, we understand the elite of his Shia. In the minor occultation, like his Nawab, some others who were led to the Imam by the Nawab, very, very elite among the Shia. In the other one, no one knows of his place except the elite of his clients. Now, his clients or mawali, khasatu mawali, are probably those who attend to his affairs, who take errands from him, do things on his order, on his behest. These may be these 30 people who do things on, 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 on his behalf. Uh, and who knows who these people are, of course. It's, it, quite secret. Apparently, his clients are those who attend to his needs. As in the following hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, لا يطلع على موضعه أحد من ولي ولا غيره إلا المولى الذي يلي أمره No one will be aware of his place, nor a friend, nor any other person. No matter how close you become to Imam in your heart, you wouldn't know where he is. Except the client who attends to his needs. These are the people. Of course, we should not expect that he lives utterly alone, doing everything himself. That would be really difficult, of course. And uh, whether he has family or not, that's, that's an issue we cannot say, certainly. So, there are people who, there are clients who attend to his needs. And also, sometimes he might want to do things in this world. And... Not all of them is done by himself, by some of his clients, taking messages sometimes. We don't know. Probably. Okay. So, it's, a long, it's life of loneliness, of course. And it is, uh, it's not something easy for the Imam, alayhi salam, as well. Of course, he is 
all the time uh, connected to, to the Lord and absorbed in the love of God. However, he is human being. I mean like the prophet who was a human being. He had other needs than just all the time being absorbed in love of God and connection to God as, as a man he had. And oh, certainly Imam alayhi salam had. So something like, can we say something like Khidr alayhi salam? It's Khidr. Uh, we have many traditions that Khidr is alive and has, has the long life until the end of this world. Uh, so maybe that would somehow alleviate the situation knowing that there is another person like him in this world living that lonely type of life. Uh, it is also reported from Imam al-Baghir and Imam al-Sadiq. Inna lisahib hadha al-amr baytan yuqalu lahu bayt al-hamd fiha sarajun yazharu mundu yawma wulada ila yawma yaqumu bil-sayf For the incumbent of this affair there is a house called the house of praise bayt al-hamd a light burns in it from the day he was born to the day that he will rise with a sword. Now, whether we have to take this metaphorically or literally, both would make sense. That, of course, where he lives is a really, really Beit hamd isn't it? Who can praise God better than him? So he, is, he lives in Beit hamd And it, it mentions that he has a house. So he, he, he just does not wander about. He has a house, and the house is most probably somewhere in Medina. Ni'ma al-manzil al-tayba. Medina is a good place of residence for him. And that house is called Bayt al-Hamd. And uh, maybe you have passed by the house, who knows. <laughs> but we do not realize certainly, of course, what that house is. And in it there is a light which burns. And this, as I said, this we can take metaphorically or literally, but, uh, whatever it may mean. Now, hadith from Zurara, again in Ghaybat al-Nu'mani, Samitu Abu Abdullah alayhi salam yaqul, inna lil qa'im ghaybatayn yarju'u fi ihdahuma. Imam al-Sadiq said, for the qa'im there will be two occultations in one of which he returns. He returns, it means that he, he disappears, but he is in contact with his Nawab, he meets his Nawab, talks to them, takes, they take messages from him. In the other, his whereabouts is unknown. You might say that now even he is in contact with some people, as we had with 30 people, but these are not his Nawab. They are not allowed to say anything. They are not allowed to take message to anyone on behalf of the Imam, for example. As soon as they say we are in connection with the Imam, the connection is lost. Of course, they, wouldn't, well, they would never say that. Uh, in one of which he returns, in the other his whereabouts is unknown. He would attend the Hajj and see the people why they do not see him. Well, this is of course very well known. Yes. People cannot see him or cannot record him? Uh, well, here it says they do not see him. Uh, I don't know if we see him and do not recognize him, that is possible as well. But the hadith here it says that they do not see him. He sees the people, they do not see him. It might mean they do not recognize him. That's possible. That's possible. Now, Ubaid ibn Zurara, this is son of the above reported, قَالَ سَمِعْتُ عَبَوْ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ سَمِعْتُ يَقُولُ يَفْقَدُ النَّاسِ إِمَامَهُمْ يَشْحَدُ الْمَوْسِمْ فَيَرَاهُمْ وَلَا يَرَوْنَهُ The people will lose their imam. He attends the mawsim, that's the hajj, and would see them, but they don't see him. Now, does he perform hajj everywhere? We don't know. Maybe. Most probably. 
if he doesn't have any other thing to do on the time of Hajj. Maybe he has. We don't know. We have some weak traditions that uh, I didn't bring them here because I do not, uh, I do not believe that that might be correct in, in casual Ummah and others that the year that he does not perform Hajj, the Hajj of people is not accepted. Well, that, uh, that might mean what? Uh, that might mean that maybe many sinners would go to Hajj and that the, all the people who go to Hajj are sinners, so he doesn't go in that year. And therefore the Hajj is not accepted. Otherwise, what's the, what's the sin of the people who go there for the, uh, with the hope of forgiveness and the Hajj is not accepted because the Imam has not attended Hajj. So that, that's a weak thing. I don't want to... Uh, well, I don't want to confuse you with uh, and myself with that tradition. However, uh, we don't know whether he attends every year or some years he, he doesn't come because of some other business that he might have. Not, of course, business in terms of uh, uh, worldly business. Hassan ibn Ali ibn Fadral, the famous, of course, uh, Fatahi, Rawi, that we accept all his traditions. Hassan Ali ibn Fadal. قال سمعت أبا الحسن علي بن مسرد عليه السلام يقول إن الخضر عليه السلام لا يحضر الموسم كل سنة. Now here, this كل سنة is here. Hassan Ali ibn Fadal reports from Imam al Raza عليه السلام that Khidr attends Hajj every year and performs all the manasik. He performs the stay in Arafah and says Amin on the prayer of the believers. So you pray something and Khair says Amin, Ya Allah, please uh, respond, accept what he says. And Allah will soothe uh, the loneliness and the apprehension of our Qa'im through his company. So when Imam, according to this tradition, this is from Kamaluddin again of Saduq, According to this tradition, when Imam alayhi salam goes to perform Hajj, he has one roommate, and that's Khadr alayhi salam. They, they perform the manasik together. And uh, so he's not very lonely there. And, and you shouldn't think that his clients, those who attend, his, his own, are always with him. He is much higher in his status than those people, so he cannot all the time have the company of these people. But uh, uh, what is important is that here in Hajj, Imam alayhi salam, Imam al Raza alayhi salam says that he is not alone in Hajj. He is with Khadr performing Hajj together. Uh, and another tradition from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, La butta lil ghulam min ghaybatin faqila lahu wa lima ya Rasulallah qala ya khafu al There will be no escape for the boy from occultation. Boy, why? Because when he went to occultation, he was a boy. He was only five years old, okay? And it's, it's a sort of uh, weird knowledge, isn't it? Of course, it's as if they see what's happening there. It's not a reported knowledge to the imam. It's just as if they see. That's why he calls him boy, the boy. The boy would certainly go to occultation. And when he was asked why, he replied, because he fears to be murdered. Yahafu al And this is, of course, uh, the same thing as uh, what we had before, that because he wants, when he comes, he has no allegiance with anyone. Because if he has allegiance, he's not killed. So he doesn't want to have allegiance with anyone. You know, he, he shouldn't have taken side with anyone. However, these are just partial answers to the question. The main philosophy behind this is unknown, as we see in the following hadith. Why he has gone to occultation, we say many different reasons, the situation, he get killed like other Aima, why should... Uh, of course, he's the last of the twelve, as the Prophet had said, so why should he be killed? However, the reason, the real reason and philosophy behind this ghaiba is unknown to us. Uh, again from Kamaluddin of Saduq. Uh, from Imam Sadiq The incumbent of this affair will have a disappearance from which there is no escape. 
in which every perverse will doubt يَرْتَابُ فِيهَا كُلُّ مُبْطِلٍ Anyone who say I'm a Shia, I'm a Muslim, but they, they are perverse people in their heart, they will doubt about it. Uh, I asked him, why uh, may I be ransomed, Ju'al to Fadak? He said, for a reason that we are not allowed to disclose for you. So he doesn't say, we don't know. We know why he goes to occultation, but we are not allowed to disclose for you. I said, so what is the wisdom behind his disappearance? He said, the wisdom behind it would not be revealed unless after he reappears. In the same way that the wisdom behind the acts of Khazr, damaging the ship, killing the young boy and erecting the wall, as you know the story in Surah Al-Kahf, was not revealed to Musa until the time of their departure. He said, do not ask me until I start to tell you. And he did not tell and tell and tell unless Musa lost patience. And just at that point of departure, he said, okay, I'll tell you why. Now here, Imam Sadiq says, you cannot, well, it means that no matter how it's explained to you, it doesn't make sense. Until he comes, it's just like what happens on the Day of Judgment. Many things which were told to us about the Day of Judgment doesn't make, don't make sense to us. Until we go and see, inshallah, soon. And see what's happening there. And here it says, until he comes, you never can apprehend, comprehend what uh, the reason behind the occultation. This issue is an issue from God. And secret from the secrets of God. In هَذَا الْأَمْرُ أَمْرٌ مِّنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَسِرٌ مِّنْ سِرِّ اللَّهِ Okay. These are, these four last slides are the translation of this hadith Lohu Fatima that I mentioned before, last week, but uh, it was only in Arabic. So you can have a look at that as well. Any questions? Okay, brother, sis, please try to use the mics. Thank you. Anybody ready? Any brothers or sisters? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam to both um, of you. It says that they're not sure if he has a family. Then why is he referred to as Abba Saleh? Uh, well, these Konyas. Well, we said we don't know whether he has a family or not. But these konya uh, are sometimes given to people even when they are born, for example, to, to men well, even when they are born. Therefore, someone who is really uh, connected to something, like for example Abu Turab for Amir al-Mu'minin because he was on the dust. And he liked that very much uh, to somehow all the time thinking that he is created from the dust. And because of course this is the the Saleh, the Saleh man on the earth, he is called Abu Saleh probably. But anyhow, as I said, we don't know really uh, about his family. And even if he has family, all the time he has to lose them, isn't it? It's because he outlives all his children, grandsons and these things. It would be very difficult. And then, of course, these families would grow and grow. I mean, 1400 years. And then, uh, I mean, walking in London or Paris or Tehran, you should see children of Imam, descendants of the Imam, knowing that they are from Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. So, most probably, 
like Khadr, he doesn't have family. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Um, when the traditions talk about the loneliness, is it talking about a physical loneliness or could it be that he is amongst the people, living with the people who don't recognize him and the loneliness is in the fact that he cannot reveal who his true identity is? Yeah, that's loneliness. I mean, suppose just someone comes and sits here, he cannot tell you who he is, you cannot talk to him, he cannot talk to you. That's loneliness. No, physical, not, not in the sense that he always lives alone, but in the sense that he cannot make contact with anyone. Thank you. Any sisters? No, brother? Going back to sisters? Yeah? Um, uh, you say that he will appear with the sword uh, of Zulfikar or the Prophet's weapon uh, and he'll kill people and all. In, even in this day there's this nuclear weapons and when it, as time advances, maybe there'll be other weapons. How does, how does that correlate the information? How will he attack the non-believers or annihilate the enemies? No, that sword is a sign. It doesn't mean that he's going to fight with that sword. That sword is a sign that he is the heir of the Prophet. And he has that inheritance from the Prophet. Certainly he's not going to fight with that sword nowadays. Uh, how is he going to fight, and I mean, today we have nuclear bombs, which hopefully, inshallah, would, uh, would be destroyed uh, through a sort of universal consensus about it. But who knows when he comes, what type of weapons we have. It's, it's not possible for us to imagine. So, that sword, the importance of that sword is that he can show it to people and say, this is the sword of the Prophet. I am the heir of the Prophet. That's the importance. It's just a sort of uh, symbolic sign. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can you pass the mic? Thank you. Alaikum um, salam. You, you mentioned some of the academic doubts that had been shed on uh, the presence of the uh, the twelfth Imam, and you mentioned the works of Shacht and Goldzer in sort of just trying to, in a sense. Um, discredit the work of hadith in its totality. Um, the doubts expressed by uh, Shia scholars, uh, sort of contemporary and in the past, you mentioned there were very few such scholars who had raised such doubts, obviously, but were their doubts based on similar grounds, sort of dismissing hadith in general, or was it the actual specific content of the hadith that they had doubts in? Uh, they have actually uh, uh, gone down the path of historical analysis of uh, events which they ha it has reached them rather than paying any attention to hadith. They have tried to make a sort of independent judgment without looking at the hadith, which is not right certainly. And in that sense that means they have completely dismissed the hadith. And that means that they did not regard the hadith to be something uh, noticeable at all. So that's a wrong, I think it's a, an utterly wrong method for analyzing these issues. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, you said that um, people who've met the Imam cannot say that they've met the Imam. Yet we've got so many stories about people who've met the Imam. So um, do we believe these stories or is it because they've died and then we find out about that? And another thing about the clients, um, could there be people that work for the Imam but they don't know he's the Imam? They don't know he's the Imam? Yeah. No. I mean, indirectly. No. Well, inshallah, all of us are working for the Imam. No. <laughs> and we don't know we are working. But those clients who attend to his needs and whatever he wants them to certainly they know that he's, he's the Imam. Now, these stories about people meeting the Imam, if you look at the, all of them, uh, you see, they say, we saw someone coming, telling something, and then he disappeared. And uh, then we said, oh, he was the Imam. Why didn't we ask him such and such questions? And uh, it, it all gives this doubt that, did they really visit the Imam? Or one of his clients? Or whatever. And uh, the... Some scholars, to somehow make compromise between these stories, 
And those firm traditions who say that whoever claims that has met me is a liar, they have said, okay, we do not reject these stories because these stories come from pious people. But then the point is that one, one explanation is that all, in all these situations, they realize he was Imam after they lost him, after he disappeared. And they say, okay, one explanation might be that you cannot meet the Imam knowing that he is the Imam. You can meet him and afterwards you realize that he was the Imam. But most of these stories are just guessing, isn't it? They guess that he was the Imam because he just came out of nowhere and then he did something very extraordinary and he went. Maybe he's Khair. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> so, yeah. Brother? Yeah, uh, yeah Shane, just um, connecting to the question before regarding historical analysis and hadith. Does this mean that um, the Shia scholars who have gone down the route of historical analysis that they somehow ignore the hadith but on the other side where we have the non-Muslims that they ignore the hadith because hadith is not part of historical analysis? Or well, they do not, they do not accept uh, this sort of transmission of knowledge at all. So they say, let us make an independent judgment about this, how these ideas came about. Uh, uh, we, we had a teacher who, 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 who wanted to teach Shia, uh, Shiism in the college, and when we discussed about things, he said, yes, of course, the idea of Hujjah, the idea of Mahdi, it, it just came about... Uh, Gradually, as the Shias found out, for example, they need a hujjah, as they found out they need an imam after the occultation. I mean, they have somehow lent their ears completely to this type of analysis. Of course, even among non-Muslim scholars, this type of analysis is now criticized greatly. That this is not a correct way to, I mean, this is not independent judgment, you have to look at the, what you have. Uh, many uh, Western scholars have criticized immensely. I mean, they have criticized Shah, have criticized others who have gone uh, down that, that path. And I think uh, this belongs to the uh, to 50s and 60s. And even the Shia scholars who have talked about this are somehow uh, very outdated now. Now, uh, this is not something which uh, any scholar could accept this type of analysis. Thank you. Uh, any sisters before we come to brothers here? No? No one is here? Uh, you haven't mentioned in the notes the actual events which took place on the birth of the Imam on the, the actual 15th night. Um, are those all the reports reliable of the... Well, you, you hear them in Majalis. Why should I mention them anymore? I mean, I, I try to bring things which uh, uh, usually are not said. Otherwise, I mean about the birth, I mean, the, when he came, praise, and uh, all these things. You have, we have these traditions, and you have heard them several times. So, I don't want to bore you with re uh, repetitions. If you want, I can bring them, but... Uh, yeah, okay. We'll have the last question from Riyadh. Thank you very much for the lecture. Sheikh, sorry to go back to the same discussion, but it's very interesting uh, regarding the hadith. I mean, my understanding that accepting hadith is not an article of faith. I mean, it doesn't have to have faith to necessarily accept historical evidence, which yeah. is, um, you know, one has to accept that it comes from an oral tradition and it is recorded at the earliest time. So um, I would, based on my very limited knowledge, agree with the fact that, you know, to ignore that leads to a false analysis. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, we do know that there are very uh, highly academic people, like Dr. Sarush, for example, who might have a view which we may not agree with. So how does he uh, base his argument? Because I'm sure it's an intellectual one. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, the point about hadith is that uh, uh, Gold Ziha, uh, at the beginning of the towards the end of the 
20th century, 19th century. And then Schacht afterwards. They uh, established a method of uh, analysis in Islamic studies, which was disregarding. In a sense, they had suspicion about every Muslim scholar. That was the basis for it. That they said, Imam Malik, Abu Hanifa, uh, Bukhari, Muslim, whoever. They, what they say is that they were not people of honor. They lied. They fabricated things. All these traditions were made up after the life of the Prophet. And they, of course, based the argument on very uh, shaky sort of uh, basis. But they, they built a sort of theory which became very common and widely accepted among scholars at the beginning of the 20th century onwards to the uh, to 1950s, 60s, even 70s. It was very widespread. And uh, the reason for the rejection of it is, as you said, this, you cannot say that all these people were liars. You cannot say all these people were just trying to compete with each other, fabricating traditions, and saying that this, is, this tradition supports our side, and they fabricate another tradition supporting our side. This is not possible. Uh, the problem is that this became the standard method in uh, study of Islam in the West. And those scholars from Muslim scholars and Shia scholars who at that time came to study Islam in Western universities, they either willingly or unwillingly were uh, somehow trapped in this type of methodology, which was the only methodology, so, so to speak. And therefore, they, the Shia scholars who wanted to analyze, especially the Shia history, like uh, or I don't want to mention names, but uh, uh, they had to, or, 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 or they thought that this is the only scholarly way of analysis, and they used the method. Now, uh, using the method means, of course, this is something that people usually are not aware of, that means that you are accusing every scholar, every Shia scholar, every Muslim scholar, of that period, that they were liars, they fabricated things, they ju you just discard history and historical facts without any reasoning, without any uh, uh, plausible cause. And as I said, now of course the method is uh, to a great extent obsolete, and even in the Western academia they do not use the method anymore, and they have criticized very immensely that uh, the method of Shah, and I don't think they are using it anymore. And I think nowadays, even Shia scholars uh, in academia, they, if they want to do the research, they would use another method rather than that historical analysis. Thank you much indeed, Sheikh. We will have to stop here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.